Hey, y'all, it's good to be here in the United States of America, Minnesota, eh? It's kind of like Can- Can- Canada, only nicer. Uh, the weather is great. Uh, I can't hardly breathe. Every time I go outside, I cough. And since I've been in here, I, I, all that high singing, I don't think my lungs can cope with it. Uh, so it's great to be here this morning. As uh, the pastor said this morning, I really believe God's opening a door here. I do not have one clue why or how or what is going to happen with this connection. But that's part of the faith, Christian faith is following through those doors yeah. and being confident that God will reveal his will in time through obedience. Uh, if I speak too fast or you're confused, I see faces sometimes. Uh, they look like a rabbit caught in headlights. Uh, just put your hand up and wave and I'll slow down a bit. Uh, some words I do say differently, uh, like power is power. Uh, I was explaining last night, what's the crack means what's happening. Or if I say I'm having a lot of crack, it means I'm having a lot of fun. <laughs> Nothing else. Uh, my first time I preached in the United States, I said that last night the pastor and myself, we had so much crack. And uh, <laughs> people's faces were a bit worried about what I had brought through customs into the United States. So this morning, uh, last night I had great crack with uh, the pastor's kids. <laughs> Woo! Uh, I, I am a pastor's kid and have been for the last 20 years of my life just to give you a bit of background. And for most of my life, I was a typical pastor's son. Eric is not a typical pastor's son. He is well-behaved and good. I was typical. Uh, And uh, in 2005, I got the opportunity to study in the United States in Iowa, in a, a college called Iowa Wesleyan, which is the smallest college in the United States, I think. And uh, I studied business there for a year. And it's whenever I was in Iowa that the Lord started to speak to me when I was 21. I'd made a profession when I was 12, but I didn't get it until I was 21. I didn't realize what it meant to be a born-again believer. I didn't realize what it took to follow Christ. And it's when I was 21, when I was in Cedar Rapids, the Lord brought me to my knees. And I realized, Lord, I need you in my life. And I can't continue on without you. I don't think this is built for my year. Uh, So in 2005, I got saved. I went home to Ireland. uh, Then people said to me, I believe you're going to be a preacher. You're going to go to the nations. You're going to speak to young people. And I laughed because I said, I will never be like my father. I don't want to be a preacher. So God's got a sense of humor. So this morning, after all that, After seeing all you've seen, if you want to know more information, because there's so much more, I could talk to you for hours on end about information, about different projects, about doors that God is opening. It all comes from one thing, and that's prayer. As Pastor Vern said, I had a sermon ready. It It was a great sermon. It had so many illustrations. It had lots of quotes. But that's not what God wanted, and that's not what God wants. So yesterday, as I got on the plane, panicking, I said to my wife, Nicola, God's changed what he's put in my heart to bring here on Sunday morning. I don't know what I'm going to do. Because your flesh wants to impress. Your flesh wants people to think, oh, that was good. I enjoyed that. But this morning, God wants to speak to us about prayer and the importance of prayer. Everything that we do in our lives as Christians starts and ends with prayer. Being filled with the Spirit of God on our knees. I was so encouraged here this morning to see people in before praying for the service. Praying for the nations. Lifting this this area up before God. In the last couple of weeks, I spent time with... Uh, our representative in a city called Hyderabad in India, Stephen David. He is a great man of God. And I was going to spend five days with this man. And do you know you get wind of a person that is really holy, that 
always reads the Bible, always prays. And the first thing that I thought was, I hope he's not so holy that he's going to annoy me. Do you know that way that, do you understand? He's just always, always going to be thou and thee and let's pray all of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes it's a bit scary. And sometimes you feel a bit inferior when people are so holy. This man is holy. This man is a great servant of God. But he's probably one of the most humble, funny, and loving men I've ever spent four or five days with. He taught me in such a short space of time the importance of prayer. And to do that, he got up at four o'clock every morning. And the reason he does that is because, number one, he knows he is dependent on prayer to get through the day. And number two, his children get up at six o'clock in the morning. And he has to get up at that time to spend time in that quiet place with God. But through that time with him, I was convicted about my prayer life. I was convicted about trying to go solo, do things on my own energy. And I want to read this verse to you. I've I've entitled this morning, A Spirit-Filled, A Spirit-Led Life. It all starts with prayer. So in Mark 1, verse 35, it says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed, that's Jesus, and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Jesus rose early to pray. Jesus got up early to pray. The Son of God got up early to pray. And I think I don't need to get up early to pray. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we all have to get up early to pray. Some people, you are at a stage in life where you're retired and you have all day where you can enjoy prayer. Maybe not. Some people, uh, you physically cannot get up early to pray. It's, it's where your heart is. It's where prayer is in the importance in your list. But for me and you, if you are able to, why do we not follow what Jesus done? Rise early to pray. Rise early to spend time on our knees before the Father. If you look at all the great men and women of faith, all of them, every single one of them, rose early to pray. And especially if you look at the likes of Spurgeon and D.L. Moody, they all rose at 4 a.m. to pray. I don't think I could do that yet. But there's something in it. There's something in this prayer thing. There's something powerful in rising early and saying to the Lord, I am going to be disciplined in my prayer, not because I have to be, but because I want to be. And that's the first step. Ask the Lord this morning, God, give me a passion to want to get up. Because if you're just getting up because you have to, what's the point? Lord, fill me. Help me to get up this morning because I have a, a desire and a hunger to spend time with you. Jesus longed to spend time with his Father. I know there's people here this morning who have who have lost their mothers and fathers. What's your longing like to spend time with them again? Jesus longed to spend time. Just one minute with the Father. I need to spend time with them. And that's what Jesus done. It was important to Jesus, and it should be important to us right now. It should be high up in our priority list. <coughs> Leonard Ravenhill said that the secret to prayer is prayer in secret getting on your knees before the Lord in secret and pleading before the throne, letting your incense rise up before his throne. Are you disciplined in personal devotion or do you make excuses? Very easily I make excuses. This morning I wanted to get up early to pray and as soon as my alarm went, I said to myself, I was in bed late, I was up a long time yesterday, The Lord will understand. Yes, he will understand. But I needed to get up and pray and bring my request before him this morning. I needed to get up this morning and ask the Lord to fill me with his spirit as I was speaking here this morning. We can make excuses. If you look at Mark 1, verse 32 to 34, just before the verse that we read, 
It said that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door and he healed many who were sick. Lots we could get out of that verse, healing, sickness. But what I want to get out of that verse is Jesus stayed up late. Jesus was doing what he was called to do. He was healing the sick. He was working into people's lives. He was showing the love of the Father. But we read in 35, he rose early before the sun came up. So he went, he he was working until the sun went down and he rose before the sun came up. I'm not saying that we have to be work, 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 work. But Jesus did not make an excuse. He followed his father's will. He healed people. He showed the love of the father, but he still rose early because he knew my power. The song said, my strength comes from the Lord. Prayer cannot truly be taught by principles and seminars it has to be born out of a whole environment of felt need we have to need prayer whenever i got saved i'd come to the end of my tether and i got on my knees and i said lord i need you i can't do anything without you i can't go any further without you all the things in my life that have been holding me back from you i don't care about anymore because i know i need you that's where prayer needs to be born out of, yeah. the need for it. Because if, you don't, if it's not born out of that, your motivation and your power will soon run out. You'll quit. I've done it so many times because the flesh is so strong. We need to be driven in prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, Reverend Stuart Holding said, How many Christians there are who cannot pray and who seek by effort Resolve joining prayer circles, etc. To cultivate in themselves the holy art of intercession and all to no purpose. Here for them and for all is the only secret of a real prayer life. Be filled with the Spirit who is the Spirit of grace and supplication. There's no point in just coming here on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night to pray if you're not praying in secret before the Lord. If you're not being built up in that secret place before the Lord, if you're not asking for the Spirit of God to fill you and indwell you, then there's no point in just coming here to pray. You do not come here to get what you can get. You come here to help and equip others. You come here to learn so that you can go out the doors and spread the good news. You come in here to be filled But you shouldn't be coming in here completely empty. You should be coming in here ready. What can I give to others? How can I encourage others? How can I be a blessing to the pastor? How can I be a blessing to the sound guys? Because they do a great job and never get any thanks. They're great. How can we encourage each other? How can I come in here this morning saying, Lord, lead me. Who in my family this morning needs built up and encouraged? That comes through prayer. Lord, who who in my congregation... In Acts, the church were not in need because they all give to each other. I came in here this morning, Lord, who needs my resources within this place because they're struggling? It all comes from being filled with the Spirit in prayer. Jim Simbala, if you haven't read his book, I can't remember the name of it, I'll tell you afterwards, Planted the Metropolitan Church. He has a book, he's talking about prayer and being Spirit-filled. In that book, he, he says that prayer is the source of the Christian life, a Christian lifeline. Otherwise, it's like having a baby in your arms and dressing her up so cute, but she's not breathing. Never mind the frilly clothes. Stabilize the vital signs. What's the point in looking good in church? What's the point in having a great drummer or great lights? What's the point in having plaques up on your house all the frilly things without the vital signs being right. Yeah. Come on, that's right. It's all about in here. It's all about spending time in the secret place with the Lord. And I believe that's over and over right in my mind. That's what the Lord's saying, in that secret place. That's what my conviction is, in that secret place. Get on your knees. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, come to me. Our call is to come, follow But not just follow, John 15 goes on to say, abide in me. Yes, you're coming to follow me, but that's not where it ends. 
You need to abide in me. That word abide means continue without fading. The only way we continue without fading is by drawing on the strength of the Lord amen. from that quiet place. Yeah, amen. I don't just call you to come. I've called you to stay. I've called you to unbroken, close fellowship. In that abiding comes the blessing. In that abiding comes the fruit. In that abiding comes that intimacy and completeness that you hear these preachers talk about. You say, where is that completeness? It comes from abiding. It's hard work sometimes to be a Christian. I'd be honest, it's hard work most of the time to be a Christian, to fully abide in God. And you hear us talking that your financial needs will be met, your health needs will be met, all these different things. They will be met as you abide in Christ. As you live your life according to the principles of the word of God, these things will then flow. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and these things will come. Not just seek first, seek first and live a life that is worthy of the call. Live a life that represents Jesus. In abiding comes blessing. In abiding comes authority. In Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus said, I have been given all authority from the Father, and so I give it to you. That's me and you. That's sonship. What does sonship mean? Sonship means, have you ever heard of John Deere's? Yeah, you know what a John Deere is? John Deere tractor. Well, think of Mr. John Deere. And Mr. John Deere knows everything about how to make John Deere tractors, but no one else does. And so one day he decides, my son, Mr. John Deere Jr., he needs to know everything I know so that he can continue on my business. So I'm going to spend time with John Deere Jr. I'm going to tell him how you make the perfect John Deere. I'm going to tell him why I paint the engine yellow and why I paint the rest green. I'm going to tell him what makes us different from everyone else so that when I go... He's going to continue on my work. I pass all authority, all knowledge on to him. And do you know why? Because I love him. That's what God does for us. Because he loves us, he's passing it all to us. It's all right there. It's all there for us to claim. It's all there for us to use his authority. But it comes from abiding. It comes from the quiet place. We are to abide with the same earnestness as when we first found Christ. Actually, we are to have more than that. I'm reading a book at the minute by Leonard Ravenhill called Why Revival Tarries. Another great read. Is is that okay? You think that's okay? (laughs) Yeah. And in that, he said, the reason we are in the place we are as the church is because we do not have enough unction. I thought that word was great. Unction means exaggerated earnestness. We need to get serious. This morning, I heard the words, wake up. I believe God has called me to America as part of my missionary capacity to do that. God has put this place on my heart because there are people in America that need to hear the love of Jesus. There are people that think they know Jesus, but they need to waken up. They need to get unction, exaggerated earnestness. It also says in exaggerated earnestness that it is a decision, a choice. So exaggerated earnestness in choice. I choose to get into that quiet place. And I choose to do that because I know in that quiet place comes abiding. In that abiding comes blessing. In that blessing comes power and authority. And that's what I want. I want power. I want authority. And I want blessing. An Australian preacher said that you can tell how popular a church is by who comes on a Sunday morning. You can tell how popular the pastor is by who comes on a Sunday night. But you can tell how popular Jesus is by who comes to the prayer meeting. Who's here to pray? This Wednesday night, weather permitting, are you going to be here to get on your knees before the Lord? After being in that quiet place. Charles Spurgeon said that the condition of the church may be very accurately gauged by its prayer meetings. So is the prayer meeting a graceometer. And from it we may judge of the amount of divine working among a people. If God be near a church, it must pray. If he, if he be not near, 
one of the first tokens of his absence will be slothfulness in prayer. And I'm not here, I'm encouraged this morning by what I've seen in prayer this morning. But there's so much more. There's so much more. My church at home is only starting to get this. We are starting every Wednesday. We're starting to come together in prayer. We're starting to understand the importance of being in that quiet place. And God is going to move. When we pray, God moves. Big things happen. And just quickly, quickly, I want us to look at Joshua 10. Because I believe this is a story of how God moves through prayer. Through that quiet time. In one person who was spirit filled. And that's Joshua. So I'll read from Joshua 10, verse 1, in the New Living Translation. I'll try and read it fast, but clearly. And some of the words I can't pronounce, so uh, feel free to help me out. Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured and completely destroyed Ai and killed its king. Just as he had destroyed the town of Jericho and killed its king. He also learned that the Gibeonites had, had made peace with, uh, had made peace with Israel and were now their allies. He and his people became very afraid when they heard all of this because Gibeon was a large town as lo- large as the royal cities and larger than Ai. And the Gibeonite men were strong warriors. So King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem sent messengers to several other kings, Hohem of Hebron, Piram of Jarmuth, Japhia of uh, Lachish, and Debar of Eglon. So their five Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack. They moved all their troops into place and attacked Gibeon. The men of Gibeon quickly sent messengers to Joshua at his camp in Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants now, they pleaded. Come at once, save us, help us. For all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country have joined forces to attack us. So Joshua and his entire army, including his best warriors, left Gilgal and set out for Gibeon. Verse 8, do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua, for I have given you victory over them. Not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. Joshua traveled all night from Gilgal and took the Amorite armies by surprise. The Lord threw them into a panic and the Israelites slaughtered uh, uh, slaughtered great numbers of them at Gibeon. Then the Israelites chased the the enemy along the road to Beth Horon, killing them all along the way to Ezka and Mechadah. As the Amorites Amorites retreated down the road from Beth Horon, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Azekah. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with the sword. On the day the Lord gave the Israelites victory over the Amorites, Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all the people of Israel. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stayed in place until the nation of Israel had defeated its enemies. At the end, it says, surely the Lord fought for Israel that day. Verse 5 says that five kings came against them. Five kingdoms came against one and the little Israelite clan. But that didn't worry Joshua. That didn't worry Joshua because Joshua was a man of prayer. Joshua was a man who spent time in that quiet place. He didn't let that deter him. So what kind of power does it take to have that faith? What kind of power does it take to stop the sun, to make the sun stand still? John 15 verse 5 to 8 in the message, I love the way the message put it, puts it, says, I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation The relation, intimate and organic. The harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you will ask will be listened and acted upon. This is how my father shows who he is. When you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. That's where the power comes from. If you make yourselves at home in me and with my words, make them at home in you, whatever you ask for will be listened. If you're in that quiet place, which then leads to 
a hunger and a, a desire for his word, a hunger and a desire to be like him. That's, that's when your prayers are going to be answered. Matthew 11, verse 25, verse 26 says, Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but you spelled them out clearly to the ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Joshua wasn't some great, educated hero. At the end, he was. Joshua was an ordinary man who had flaws just like you and me. He had sinful desires. But at the start of Joshua, he was told three times, be strong and courageous. Why? Because he needed to be told three times, Joshua, do you not get it? Be strong and courageous, for I am with you. Be strong and courageous. I know you're a failure. I know you're just a man. I know you're sinful. But be strong and courageous, because I am going to use you. I see your time in that quiet place. I see your heart. I am roaming the earth looking for people who I can use to glorify my name. And you're one of them. Who wants to hear that? So Joshua sought God and put him first. Joshua struck first though. Joshua didn't wait. He had a word from the Lord saying, go and do this and you will be victorious. He didn't sit. What are you doing? I'm... Just, just waiting. The Lord said he was going to do something, so I'm just waiting on him to do it. How many of us have something from the Lord in our hearts and we just sit around and wait? God's put a nation in my heart, but I'm going to sit and wait. God's put a person in my heart that I have to tell about Jesus. I'm going to sit and wait. No. Go. Get up. Do something. Move. That's when God's going to move. The Red Sea didn't part for the children of Israel until they put their foot in it. When they put their foot in, the Red Sea spread. It's only when we move, when we act in faith on something the Lord has put. It wasn't uncalculated risk from Joshua. It was a risk he took because he had a word from the Lord in that quiet place. The enemy sensed the presence of something greater and they fled. They ran. They sensed the presence of the Lord. They smelt the presence of the Lord. That fragrant aroma coming from his people. They knew there was something different. How many people have been in the presence of someone? I know there's something different about them. I want that. I want that. I want people to sense something from me that is greater. But it's not because of me. It's because of the one who lives within me. The sun was going down and the battle was not over. But Joshua didn't go, oh no God, you failed me. And I know last week uh, I heard Pastor Vern a little bit of his sermon about when God doesn't seem to answer prayers or come through. Does that mean he's not sovereign? Does that mean he's not working? God, you promised me every single one of these soldiers would be killed and we would have complete victory. That hasn't happened. I'm going to just sit here. I'm going to hide behind my army. No. He said, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to pray a prayer that where if God doesn't come through, we're done for. If God doesn't act, we're done for. But if he does, look at the power that comes from his presence. Look at the power that we are able to proclaim his name because he made the sun stand still. Francis Chan had a book out um, about the Holy Spirit and he asks us, would our churches, would our lives be any different if we didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit? If we didn't have the presence of God or the Holy Spirit acting in our lives, would our lives look any different to they are now? What do we need to pray in our lives? What sun stand still prayers do we need to pray that we need God to come through? That we are going to have faith for God, not rely on our own resources, our banks, our own decisions. Joshua thought back to the promised land or to the promise of God and prayed, Let the sun stand still. My friend Pastor Daniel says that what you ask for, ask God for, is a reflection of the power that he has in your life. What do I mean by that? Think of King David as he went into battle with Goliath. The army of the Israelites were terrified, were stricken in fear. Because of that fear, they could not act and they wouldn't act because God was little and the giant was big. One little boy, King David, comes strolling in who had been spending time in that quiet place and he said, my God is big and the giant is small. 
It's about perspective. I find the page. I can almost hear David saying, you can chase me, you can persecute me, you can do anything you want with me. But when my God comes, you're in big trouble, boy. You're in big trouble. The Lord heard him and acted. When we lift our hearts in prayer to God, big things start to happen. Do you believe God can make big things happen in your life? He can put dreams in your heart. That verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, about I know the plans I have for your life, is totally out of context. That's, that's not, it wasn't meant for us in that way. But it is meant for us in that way because he does know the dreams and plans and he does have bigger and higher things for us. He has so much planned for us. All we need to do is come into his will in line with what he wants us to do. The only way we're going to know that, time in the quiet place with the Lord. What spiritual breakthroughs do you need in your life? Is it for unsafe family? Joshua didn't just stand there and mumble. Please God, let the sun stand still. It says that he prayed it in front of the whole army of Israel. God, let the sun stand still. As we pray here this morning over God, please open up doors in my family who don't know you. Help me to be bold, soften their hearts. Help me to bring in the gospel into their lives in a loving way. God, I need a job. I'm praying this morning in front of people. I need a job. And when you come through, I'm going to share that amazing God story. God, my finances, I need you to help. God, my calling, I have somewhere in my heart, I, I believe I'm meant to go to the mission field. I'm so scared, I don't know what to do. God, I'm, I am scared. I don't know what to do. I'm waiting on you. Speak to the Lord. If you remember back to Daniel, he was in the lion's den. He was in the fiery furnace. He didn't wait until obstacles came in his way to pray. Before he went into the lion's den, it says in Daniel 6 verse 10, and Daniel prayed, he continued as always, as he had always done. He didn't just pray when the tough got going. The prayer, or the secret to prayer, is prayer in secret. He was in the secret place. He was ready for whatever the devil had to throw at him. Now, when I go into, it's called Tesco's, over here it's called Walmart. I was in Walmart a few years ago, and I was looking for my wife and my son. My wife's very short, so there's no chance of seeing her. Uh, over all the racks. And what I done was I listened for the voice of my son. Because I knew my son, because I spent time with him, and because I listened to him all the time, talking, sometimes yapping, I know his voice above any other little children's voices. And so I walked into Walmart and I listened. And at the very far end, I heard his little voice. I was able to go straight to him. And that came from knowing him spending time with him. And it's the same with the Lord. Unless we spend time with him, sometimes in all the mess, sometimes if we're not in that quiet place, we're going to hear other voices that aren't the Lord. And they're not always the devil. Sometimes they're our flesh and sometimes they're just plain silliness. But a lot of the time it's the devil. But we're not going to know the difference in the voices unless we spend time with him. Isaiah 41 verse 10. For whatever situation we're in, the Lord says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Joshua had doubts and fears. He had flaws, but he believed in God. He believed when he said, be strong and courageous. I'm going to be strong and courageous. And I'm going to end here. That's the worst thing to do is put your shoes on when a preacher says, I'm going to end here. Don't put your shoes on yet. (laughs) This morning, I want to overemphasize the importance of prayer and what a praying people can accomplish. I want to read at the start of this book, this was a prayer that Leonard Ravenhill's uh, son uh, wrote about his father. 
And hopefully you'll get from this the importance of prayer and what prayer can do to a man's heart and desires. I knew a man who gave his life to see revival fire. He prayed by day, he prayed by night to birth this one desire. He had but one obsession to see a glorious bride arrayed in spotless purity brought to her bridegroom's side. His power while in the pulpit was matched by very few and yet he loved the closet there with the God he knew. While others strove for man's applause, for fortune and for fame, he had but one ambition, to exalt his master's name. For 87 years he lived just for eternity, a man of faith and wisdom and true humility. He knew one day he'd have to stand before God's judgment seat, and so he ran to win the prize, his mission to complete. The fortune that he left behind was not in stocks or gold, but lives transformed and challenged, their stories yet untold. There is no greater privilege than this that I have had of knowing this great man of God and having him as dad. This morning, we want to leave a legacy behind. We don't want to leave gold and stocks, unless the Lord says that's what he wants you to leave. We want to leave a legacy for our children and our children's children. We want to bring them up in a way that glorifies the Lord and prepares them for their future. That all comes through time in the quiet place. First Peter 2, get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. If I came here in 35 years' time and brought my son Daniel who will be 39, and said, this is my son Daniel, he's 39, he's still in nappies and still has a bottle every night before bed, physically we would think that's crazy. But there's some of us, I'm not saying here, but there are people who are Christians, who have been Christians for 20 years, who are still in nappies and drinking from a bottle every night. Go deeper with the Lord, get into the quiet place, And lastly, my good friend Stephen David from India said, the more we seek God, the more we see our need to seek him. So let's do that this morning. I'm just going to close in prayer and ask God just to help us and bless us. Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to speak here this morning, Lord. And what a privilege it is to bring your word. Lord, I pray this morning, Lord, you would convict us, Father, as I've been convicted, Lord, that we get into that quiet place, Lord. Give us a hunger and a desire for your word, Lord, a hunger and a desire that won't be quenched. And Father, I I pray that you would help us to mature into men and women of faith. Lord, men and women that will glorify your name in this area, in this country, in this nation, in the nations, Lord. I pray this morning, Father, that people who have countries on their hearts, Lord, Father, continue to give them dreams and visions. Whether it's just for here, whether it's for Minnesota, for the United States, for South America, and for Asia, for Europe, Father, everywhere needs you. And I pray you'd birth dreams in here this morning, Lord. I thank you for pastors that want to train and equip and send. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would from this place train, equip and send your disciples to the nations, Lord. Lord, I speak this over this place, Lord, that this will be a mighty church that will send, send people. It doesn't matter if they're young or old. They will send people who will bring glory to your name, who will spread the good news, who will tell people of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll give you the praise and the glory this morning, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.